Hi everyone, I'm planning on doing a monthly video where I wrap up everything that I've read over the past month. Uh, this is something a lot of booktubers do, and uh, because on my blog, lonesomereader.com, I tend to do quite long, in-depth reviews of everything I read. So this will just give you a brief summary of what the book is about and snippets of what I think about it or what I thought was best about it or um, what I thought was worst about it. Uh, but if you're interested in anything that I talk about, if you click on Show More, I'll post links to all of my full reviews about these books. Uh, so, the um, month which just went by, June, I did a lot of reading. I read 12 books in total, which is more than I usually read, but uh, I had a lot of time to, um, uh, to, to do a sort of marathon of reading because my boyfriend went away for a week, so, um, so I just sat down and got stuck into a lot of really great books. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in and start talking about them because I think um, a lot of these are really exciting, really interesting books. So this is the pile of books that I read. Uh, there were also three ebooks um, I read which uh, are over here, um, which I don't actually have physical copies of. So I'm going to get stuck right in and talk about them each individually. The first book I read in June was called Negro Land by Margot Jefferson. It was published in June by Grant of Books. And this is actually a memoir, and I don't read all that many memoirs, but the subject of this uh, I thought was really intriguing and interesting. It's a, about what, uh, what Margot Jefferson terms as Negroland is a certain section of African-American society which is privileged and wealthy who aren't able to fully integrate into white society because of the color of the skin. Uh, but that at the same time feel somewhat distanced um, from black society uh, and try to distance themselves from the sort of stereotypes of a uh, typical African-American. So, um, and she grew up in this society, in this state of mind. So it's about her conflict uh, about that. She writes about the history of black Americans who um, have been a part of this, who um, who have been privileged and who have used that privilege either um, for their own advancement or to help the general black population um, to advance in society. And uh, there's a lot of painful um, memories about her childhood, about her conflicts uh, feel and feelings about this. And I found it really striking, uh, really interesting and thoughtful and uh, but also um, it's really touching um, just about on a human level about our development and our realization of ourselves of our identity and how we fit into society um, both in our gender there's um, a wonderful bit where she writes about um, her early love of reading uh, where she writes how I was a jealous little she-reader I resented pouring myself into the lives of boys. And she talks about how she couldn't identify with all these really male, um, adventure-driven stories uh, that she read. The title of this really stands out, obviously, uh, and, and is quite um, provocative. And it's meant to be. It's supposed to make you stop and think, uh, although it did uh, make me feel quite self-conscious reading this out in public because it made me worried uh, what people <laughs> thought I was reading about. But don't let that stop you. This is a great memoir that I'd really recommend. The next book I read was a novel called La Rose by Louise Erdrich. Uh, this is was published in May by Little Brown, and it's the first novel I've read by Louise Erdrich, even though she's a very famous, very prominent American author. She's one of those um, writers that I've always wanted to get around to reading, but never have. And this is the story of a family, well, it's a story of two families, actually, who are neighbors who live side by side, and it begins with a very a disastrous event, and the rest of the novel is about the sort of consequences of that, how the families deal with that. At one point, one of the families offers um, their youngest son, called the Rose, to the other family to live with them to help them get over the trauma of this event that happens at the beginning of the novel, which is a obviously a very shocking, controversial thing to do, and it creates a lot of conflict. 
between these families, between themselves. It's um, about this small community in North Dakota and uh, this uh, Native American reservation and the um, various issues that they face and deal with the legacy of issues that uh, Native Americans have had to deal with over time um, through generations. It shows generations of uh, these families and um, the various conflicts that they've encountered, problems that they have to deal with. And uh, But it's also just a beautiful novel about family, about their development, about the conflicts um, between mother-daughter, between a man and his friend, um, about a uh, boy and his um, estranged father. One of the shocking things it, it shows is um, the um, writer Frank LeBaum, it quotes a um, section that uh, he wrote in his early journalism uh, where he advocated for the annihilation of the Native American population in this really shocking, blunt way. And this was obviously a um, sort of much-loved writer who wrote The Wizard of Oz, uh, but um, this was true and I'd never realized this before. But she um, also goes into the, um, the complex emotional lives of her characters and um, at, at some points um, in the narrative it gets a bit surreal and wild uh, but then other parts are really starkly realistic really emotional and moving and it's a great novel um, that I'd really recommend and I really want to read more of Louise Erdrich's writing. Next is The Lonely Sea and Sky by Dermot Bolger. This was published by New Island Books in April. This is a very uh, dull cover because this was a proof copy, uh, but this is what the real cover looks like. Dermot Bolger is a very well-known Irish writer. He's published several books, uh, but this is the first novel of his that I've read. The book is based on the true account of an Irish cargo ship during World War II, which was sailing back from Portugal, and they encountered in the waters a German ship that had sank and hundreds of German soldiers and sailors in the water who were drowning. They had to act fast and they decided to save as many as possible. Even though they were quite a small cargo ship, it was quite risky for them to take all these German soldiers aboard because Ireland at that time was a, a neutral country during the World War II could have gone very wrong for them, where the German soldiers might have turned on them and taken over their ship. A lot of Irish cargo ships at that time were just being used as target practice by uh, the Warren forces. Dermot Bulger um, fictionalizes this and really brings it to life through the eyes of a 14-year-old boy named Jack. He's very naive. Obviously, he's very um, scared, uh, and there's a lot of pressure on him because his father was also a sailor who was lost at sea, and his mother and his siblings are at home on the brink of starving, and they are reliant on his income in order to survive. So, uh, it, um, this is also sort of a coming-of-age story. It's a historical novel, and it's a really interesting exploration of World War II and a neutral country's position during that time, and a, uh, just a great sort of seafaring epic, which I really enjoyed. Next is a very different sort of novel called Moonstone by Sejan, who's a Icelandic writer. This was published in June by Scepter. This is a also a historical novel, uh, but it, from in a very different style. It's a, about a um, fictional boy named Manny Stein in the year 1918, and this was a very significant year in Iceland because it was the year that Iceland became independent, and it's also the year that the Spanish flu was sweeping through the country and was devastating, particularly to uh, people in Reykjavik, and wiped out a lot of the um, pop significant amount of the population. And Manny is a uh, boy prostitute. He sells himself to older men, uh, and he falls in love with the cinema, particularly French silent cinema, and it just explodes his way of looking at the world. He suddenly sees that there's different possibilities in life, different ways of living from the provincial lives of people around him, 
and he has lots of fantasies. It's a very different way of looking at history. It's a really poetic, strong, visionary novel, hallucinatory in places, and really and experimental and really exciting, and it's just a joy to read. Next is Vinegar Girl by Anne Tyler. I was very excited to read this book. This was published in June by Hogarth. It's part of their Shakespeare series, where they get famous authors to do remixes of famous Shakespeare plays. I had read Jeanette Winterson's um, great novel called The Gap of Time, which is her remix of A Winter's Tale. And this is Anne Tyler's take on The Taming of the Shrew. And she modernizes it. She puts it in her native Baltimore, where many of her novels are set. The story of a girl named Kate, and uh, who is a very sort of awkward teacher's assistant, and there are some very funny scenes where she's sort of bundling in the school. She doesn't really know how to relate to children. She's very blunt and overshares with them and very direct with them in a way that goes totally against the way our current culture sort of coddles children and plays down to them. But uh, she goes against all of that. And she has a scientist father who she sort of takes care of, um, and she also takes care of her younger sister. Her mother is not in the picture. Her father wants to set her up with a man named Piotr, who is his laboratory assistant, and whose visa is about to expire. So he gets this idea that Kate could marry him, and then he would be allowed to stay in the country. And the novel plays out from there. Uh, but I felt it sort of lagged in a few places, and it doesn't have the same humanity that Tyler usually gets to in her writing. Her last novel, A Spool of Blue Thread, was a magnificent book. And Tyler is brilliant at getting at the profound details of ordinary life, of family life, of the conflicts of family, uh, but this novel doesn't quite live up to the great heights of some of her other books, like Ladder of Years, which is personally one of my favorite novels. So I enjoyed this book, but it wasn't quite as great as I was hoping it would be. Next is A Quiet Life by Natasha Walter. Uh, this is a, another proof copy, so this isn't how the book actually looks. Um, that's how the book looks. Um, it was published in June by Burrow Press, and uh, Natasha Walter is a feminist. She's published nonfiction books before, but this is her first novel. It's about a woman named Laura in World War II. She's an American who comes to Britain, and she meets a man and falls in love, and they marry, and she gets involved in the Communist Party, and she and her husband actually become spies for the Soviet Union. Natasha Walter was inspired to write this when she was doing research about a real group of English communist spies in Britain during World War II. And, uh, but she, it sort of set off her imagination and she created this whole novel around this woman who is caught in the middle of it. It has all the elements of a spy novel. Will they get caught? Won't they get caught? There's tension and secret meetings. Uh, but what's so special about it is it really gets to the humanity of Laura. Uh, she's, a, in many ways, a very passive observer of the society around her, but she sees all of the injustices that are going on, the inequality of women, the social inequality, the economic in inequality, and she does something about it secretly. She really reminded me of a Doris Lessing character, and it's written in a very sort of Doris Lessing sort of novel, that um, where it's very politically aware, uh, but also really psychologically insightful. And I just really connected with Laura. I don't know if it's because she's an American and I'm an American, and she views British society as an outsider, uh, much as I do, uh, but I really appreciated her point of view and uh, enjoyed it, and I thought it was a really tense, fascinating, insightful novel, and a really different look at World War II. I think Natasha Walter is a very fantastic fiction writer, and I hope she writes more novels. The Museum of You by Karis Bray. 
This was published in June by Hutchinson. It's the story of Clover, who's an adolescent girl, and it's the school holidays, and she's really enjoying just working in her father's allotment garden. Her father is a man named Darren, who drives a bus, and uh, they live alone together. Um, her mother isn't there, and uh, you find out over the course of the novel what happened to her mother. In their house, there is a room with all of her mother's belongings, and she's not allowed to go in that room, but when her father is out on the bus, he, she um, sneaks in and she starts looking through her things. And she's a girl who's obsessed with museums, and she gets the idea to curate her own gallery and exhibition about her mother. And so she starts putting all the pieces together and trying to piece out what actually happened to her mother because she's never actually been told. And it's just a beautiful way of getting at the grief and longing that a girl feels for her lost mother that she never even knew. Uh, there's a line which goes, When you grow up in the saddest chapter of someone else's story, you're forever skating on the thin ice of their memories. And I thought that was such a beautiful way of getting at the inherited grief in a family when a beloved member of that family has been lost. And uh, this is a very human novel. It's about ordinary people and their struggles in life. Um, there's also a relative who um, deals with mental health issues. Uh, Clover befriends a outcast foreign girl who suffers a lot of abuse and bullying, uh, but they become friends in a very touching way. And it's a very moving novel that uh, I really enjoyed and was very touched by. Next I read Multitudes by Lucy Caldwell. She's a Northern Irish writer, and this was published in April by Faber. It's a book of short stories, and they're really varied. Um, there's a story um, called Poison about a teenage girl who tries to seduce her teacher. There's a story about a mother who has lost her daughter and she listens to the classical music that that daughter recommended shortly before her unexpected death. Um, and there's also a story about a six-year-old boy who longs to dress as a Disney princess. Um, most of the stories, though, do revolve around adolescent experience, around teenage experience, and all of the physical and emotional and sexual changes that go on around that time. It's about all of the possibilities in life that we see at that time, the multiple ways we can go in life, the desire to leave where we came from, and the desire to return to where we came from. Uh, these are really beautiful, fascinating stories written with um, really interesting different structures. A lot of them are narrated in the second person and so are very direct. They feel like they're your own experience if you would happen to have been born somewhere else and as someone else and uh, I really connected with a lot of them, and I think she is a really fascinating writer. Next I read another book of short stories. This one is called The Dream Life of Astronauts by Patrick Ryan. It's actually being published in July by the Dial Press in America. I don't think it has a UK publisher, uh, but it's a book I really wanted to seek out and read uh, because I love Patrick Ryan's writing. Uh, ten years ago, I read his novel called Send Me, and uh, this um, he's written some other young adult novels in between, and uh, this is his first book of short stories. A couple of the stories actually have the some of the same characters from this novel Send Me, but you don't need to have read this novel in order to get the stories and get the characters. Uh, the, the stories are really varied. There is a story about a man who is convinced his wife is trying to poison him. There's the story of a flirtatious grandmother who is forced to take a driver's ed class. And there's the story of a pregnant teenage girl who dreams of becoming Miss America. Uh, all of these stories are set in Florida. Many of them are either directly or loosely related or uh, linked to 
the NASA space program, uh, which is based in Florida, he really evokes that sense of the American dream and of our collective dream of progressing as a society and growing and evolving out of our very human condition. But what these stories show is um, through many of the characters that we're really stuck in our human condition and in our ordinary problems of daily life, of our economic problems and our family strife and our relationship squabbles and there's infidelity and jealousy. And uh, he shows all of this um, through these characters in a very funny and human and sophisticated way. Patrick Ryan is a very talented author and I really recommend that you seek him out. Next I read The Muse by Jesse Burton. This was published by Picador at the end of June. Uh, you can actually see the publication date on this proof copy. This is the hotly anticipated second novel by Jesse Burton. Her first novel, The Miniaturist, was a major bestseller, uh, but I hadn't actually read that novel. Uh, but I heard her read from this novel at a special event, and uh, it really gripped me. I thought it was really funny and engaging, and uh, so I was really eager to go and read it. And uh, I was pleased that uh, it really lives up to the expectations from that reading. Dual narrative, where in the first part, um, it starts in 1967 with a character named Odell, who uh, she's a woman uh, who is from the Caribbean, and she's been living in London for a number of years. And she gets an opportunity to go work at an art institute with a very interesting woman named Marjorie Quick. And uh, she meets a man who um, she develops a romantic relationship with, and he possesses a painting which he recently inherited, uh, which turns out to be a significant work of art, and it has very mysterious origins. And so then the story flips to 1936, and a character named Olive, who lives with her parents, her father is an art dealer, in southern Spain, her father is of Austrian descent and her mother is English, and they live in southern Spain at this time when uh, the Spanish Civil War is just brewing and starting. And, uh, and she's an artist, but she feels like she can't come out as an artist because she doesn't think her father will take her seriously. She sort of paints in secret. And so it's about these um, two different stories and uh, it moves between them in a thrillerish way um, that grips you and takes you along. And it, um, it reminded me very much of a Sarah Waters novel, something like Fingersmith, sort of like that, in the way it grips you. And you get some hints and can guess what might happen, and then other times it really takes you by surprise, and then you, um, and you only discover what happens later. Uh, so. I thought this was a really fascinating book, um, not just as a thriller, but also of the way um, of uh, people are viewed racially in the 1960s, um, and also the uh, political turmoil in southern Spain in the mid-1930s. Most of all, it's an enjoyable, gripping, joyous novel. I read a book called The Abundance by Annie Dillard. It was published in April by Canongate, and this is a collection of essays. Annie Dillard's writing is really unclassifiable. She, she blurs the line between poetry and essay and autobiography and uh, combining it all to really form these profound, fascinating statements about life. It sounds highfalutin, but, but actually her writing is really accessible and uh, and it'll just like grip you and take you along. I sort of found myself going through like highlighting line after line, you know, it, it, it's that sort of writing that is just so inspirational um, that it makes you want to record it all down. Uh, she writes a lot about um, her adolescence. There's this one great line that um, I loved. She, she wrote about her teenage years where she described herself as, I was a dog barking between my own ears, a barking dog who wouldn't hush. And I love how that line captures that sense of teenage years of rebellion and having so much to say and not listening to anyone else. 
and uh, and so she she can do this to speak really meaningfully about teenage years and growing up but then also in adult life uh, of all the endless questions that we have about life and the mystery of being and um and again this sounds like it all it's all very out there but uh but again i can't stress enough that her writing is very accessible i just find it so poetic and meaningful and insightful and she is endlessly inspirational so i really recommend that you read her if not this book then um, her other book of essays, Teaching the Stone to Talk, or For the Time Being, or An American Childhood, or A Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Uh, there's so many of her books to explore and enjoy. This book also comes with a foreword by Jeff Dyer, which is really insightful, and he encapsulates the meaning of Annie Dillard much better than I ever could. Are you still with me? We're almost there. The 12th novel that I read this month is Imagine Me Gone by Adam Hazlitt. This was uh, published in June by Hamish Hamilton, and uh, Adam Hazlitt is a great writer. He's published two other books, um, really acclaimed novels, a book of short stories, and then another novel called Union Atlantic, which I both loved. So I was so excited to read this new novel of his. It's a great book that explores many themes that he's looked at before but in a slightly different way. He frequently explores issues of mental health and sexuality and family life and uh, these are all present in this novel. It's, um, it's a story of a family, a couple, an American woman and a British man uh, and their three children and the father suffers from depression and uh, his son his eldest son, Michael, also um, suffers from mental health issues, and it's about the repercussions of that, how that trickles down in the family and affects their behavior, the way it uh, causes disruptions, um, but then also brings them together. He's a really forceful and emotional writer. There's a passage at the beginning where the father is reading to his youngest son, Alec, and he writes that Alex will be quieted to the point of trance by the story, but also because his father's attention is pouring over him and only him like the air of heaven. And I read that line and it just got to me and it really reminded me of when I was young and my father was reading to me and that special attention that you get from a parent who is reading to you and that connection you have. And so while this novel explores a lot of difficult themes about drug abuse and particularly the way that doctors, some doctors in America freely hand out drugs and how those prescription drugs begin, can become addictive, this novel also has a tender side and has really beautiful moments between the family members. And the style can also vary wildly um, between some very realistic moments between family members, but then some quite like surreal, heady moments uh, where the eldest son, Michael, is describing uh, things in a, a very like bombastic way. So, uh, but it all comes together to form this fascinating picture of a family and I think Adam Hazlitt is an extraordinary writer and this was a great novel to end on. So those were the books that I read in June. Another highlight for June was I was lucky enough to be invited to the Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction ceremony. Uh, I spoke in a previous video about my thoughts of on all the shortlisted books, uh, the, a really great diverse selection of books that were shortlisted for this prize and it was wonderful to see Lisa McNerney uh, crowned the winner of this year's Bailey's Prize for Fiction. Uh, I had a fantastic time at the party where I got to speak to lots of journalists and publishers and authors. I was uh, lucky enough to meet Cynthia Bond, the wonderful writer Cynthia Bond, and her fantastic novel Ruby. 
so um, I had a great time and I felt like a very lucky boy. So thank you very much for uh, listening to my thoughts on all these novels. If you're interested in reading them, them, or if you have read any of them, please let me know your thoughts. Also, let me know what you've been reading. I'd really be interested to hear what other people are reading and what I've been missing out on. If you want to hear more of my thoughts about books, please hit the subscribe button, and hopefully I'll do a video about what I read in July. So stay tuned. Thank you.